presentation and to meet him finally. And anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my talk and I think we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, my topic is narrating disability inside and out, inside and outside the clinic and I, I want to explore two distinct, my talk really has two halves, it's going to be two distinct matters, each of which I think has ethical dimensions. What happens first when clinical narratives of disability go public and second, what happens when disability and illness are conflated within the clinic? So there will be two quite distinct parts to the talk, but I think there is a connection. Now, I'm going to be addressing some moral hazards inherent in life writing about illness and disability, but before I do that, and because I'm doing it, I want to be clear that um, I don't want to do anything, I don't want to say anything that would discourage the, the writing of life, the, 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 the practice of, of life writing about disability and illness. I've devoted the latter half of my career to, to reading and writing about published narratives of illness and disability, and I wouldn't have done so unless I found these narratives compelling. I, I really began this work about 20 years ago now, in the mid-90s, you know, I noticed that people were publishing lots of narratives about illness and disability, and I, I began to read them and write about them, and I found myself literally without knowing it existed uh, in the field of disability studies. But um, the writing of such narratives has continued to proliferate, and I've argued in um, various places uh, that the so-called memoir boom in the U.S. and perhaps in the U.K. as well has coincided with, and to extent, some extent been driven by, uh, the rise of such narratives. I have compiled a long list of conditions from anxiety and autism to Tourette's and vitiligo that have generated memoirs in the last 20 years and the list continues to grow. Recently, I came across a book review of two narratives of amnesia. Well, think about that. <laughs> How do you do it? Well, you interview people who knew you before your amnesia struck, and, and what a great project that is. I mean, that's how you find out who you were and who you are, and becomes a necessarily a collaborative project. And Anyway, whether inside, uh, you could say that the illness narrative of disability narratives has been something of an American literary epidemic. Uh, some people think it's, you know, it's gone too far, we have too many, but I don't. Whether inside the clinic such narratives can be in and of themselves restorative, if not healing. In her introduction to depression and narrative, telling the dark, Hilary Clark said it well. We should listen to personal narratives of illness and disability, really attending to them and their own merits, as opposed to using them in order to come to diagnoses and impose regimes of treatment because such narratives give voice to the ill, the traumatized, and the disabled, those trying to make sense of the catastrophic interruptions or shifts in their lives and help them navigate the bewildering, impersonal context of medical diagnosis and treatment. And one of those traumatic experiences would be, or catastrophic interruptions would be the onset of amnesia. So please don't misunderstand me. Nothing I say today should be construed as intending to discourage writing about illness and disability. I'm only concerned to point out certain dangers that are inherent in this endeavor. Inside the clinic today, um, psychiatry, as you probably know, is moving away from narrative therapy toward drug therapy. As this is happening, interestingly, narrative competence is being emphasized, at least by some, in the treatment of non-mental illness. I refer here to the clinical approach known as narrative medicine, as advanced primarily by Dr. Rita Sharon. According to, to Sharon, the narrative approach elicits, quote, accounts of self that include emotional, familial, aspirational, creative aspects of the self. Thus, in narrative medicine, a physician's relation to her patients approaches that of a psychotherapist. The aim and claim of narrative medicine is that it recognizes patients' full personhood, addressing their illnesses as part of multidimensional life narratives. So far, so good. But greater knowledge of parents, patients, <laughs> patients' lives can enable the writing of invasive case studies. Indeed, in, in a paper given at a 2000 MLA, MLA convention in a panel I was part of, Rita Sharon herself acknowledged this. Her title, Listening, telling, suffering, and carrying on, colon, reflective practice or health imperialism indicates the possibility that rather than empowering patients, narrative medicine may amplify the power of clinicians at the expense of patients. It may thus increase the risk of what I call deferred iatrogenic pain, 
iatrogenic pain, as you may know, is pain caused by medical treatment. And I coined the term deferred, or maybe I should have said referred, uh, iatrogenic pain, to refer to suffering inflicted on patients not by their treatment, but by narratives of their treatment. This can happen when the boundary of the clinic, always porous, is breached. Stories that originate in the clinic can cause pain to patients or their families when they're encountered outside the clinic. Consider this case. When I was speaking at an American university a couple of years ago, a student approached me, a graduate student. At the age of seven, I'll call her Julia, she was operated on for significant physical impairment which required ongoing medical attention. To help her cope with this regimen, uh, she was sent to a therapist. Nearly two decades later, learning that the therapist had been appointed to a prestigious academic post, Julia looked her up online, just out of curiosity, as anyone could do these days. The therapist's resume listed an article Julia thought might be about her. Reading it confirmed her suspicion, and she found it deeply unsettling. This anecdote illustrates, for starters, how the Internet has shrunk our world. We all have less privacy than we used to, and it's ever easier to trace others and references to ourselves. Scenarios such as Julia's, however, don't really require the Internet. Uh, the New York Times has an ethics columnist, and someone wrote to him a couple of years ago saying that he was browsing in a bookstore, and he came across a, a, a book of uh, clinical case stories, and he found what he thought was his own story. He said, well, what's going on here? Is this, is this legitimate? And he found it, the point is, he found it unsettling to find what he was sure was his story out there circulating in public. These stories reveal that even when clinicians disguise the identity of their patients, and both patients have been disguised, patients may recognize themselves should they happen upon their own case studies. And this recognition is very likely to cause them discomfort. These therapists probably thought they had done everything required by professional ethics they probably had. But while the clinician may have behaved ethically and even empathetically in the clinic, in the extra-clinical representation, the patient's feelings have not been taken into consideration. At the time of her treatment, Julia was far too young to grant consent, so her therapist concealed her identity behind a pseudonym. Julia's youth may have led that therapist to discount the likelihood of her ever reading the article, but she did, and she readily recognized it as her case, and she felt somehow violated. The presumption of anonymity was not sufficient to protect her. The point is that ethical guidelines do not guarantee that case histories may not ca cause pain to their subjects. Such pain may not rise to the level of manifest harm, and thus clinicians may not have violated the Hippocratic precept to do no harm. But in Julia's case, the pain was far from negligible, despite being long de delayed. That's why I call it deferred iatrogenic pain. More to the point, it may have been avoidable, or maybe not. It may not always be possible to conceal patients' identities from them. The rarer the case, the more publishable, and the very details that warrant writing up a rare case and may enable patients to recognize themselves. In any event, among the potential readers of case studies, patients are uniquely equipped to know all the identifying details and, of course, who provided treatment. They may, they may resent the presumption of authorship on the part of clinicians. Even if their rights have not been violated, the question is whether the, their discomfort is outweighed by the benefits of the narrative. The question then becomes, who benefits? Presumably, the goal of writing case histories is to advance the, public's understand, advance the understanding of particular conditions and improve their treatment. In principle, the case history serves the welfare of all, the public health. At the same time, there are undeniable benefits to the author in committing a, pay, a case to print. Doing so can build a reputation and advance a career and lead to monetary gain. Consider Oliver Sacks, the world's most leading neurologist whose fame and fortune are based not on original contributions to neurology, but on his non-clinical case studies of unusual syndromes. So medical professionals are not in the best position to judge the merits of writing up a particular case. Indeed, the writing of case studies may entail a conflict of interest. Authors stand to gain from them in a way that is not true for their subjects, and this may affect their judgment of the medical benefits of such projects. Excuse me. Um, I cannot speak for Julia. Indeed, she herself is not sure just wh why she was so troubled by reading her case, and she's currently grappling with that. 
and I look forward to hearing what she finally comes up with. My sense is that a patient's discomfort may be a function of the intrinsic disparity between the patient's and the clinician's relation to a case. The patient comes to the cl clinician in the hope of empathetic help, of care, if not of cure. To the professional, however, the patient represents an instance of something beyond itself, beyond herself, perhaps a condition in which the professional has an intellectual interest or even a research program. The hurt caused by a patient's self-recognition may arise from the feeling that one has been reduced to one's condition and thereby objectified. What disappoints and offends a patient who reads her own case narrative then may be the discovery that she is not just a person or even a patient, but also a case, indeed a case of X to her therapist or physician. Thus, the patient who reads her own case may make the uncomfortable discovery that in the therapeutic relationship, her well-being was not an end in itself, or at least not the only end. She has also been a means to an end. Whether she values that end may depend on what she takes it to be. If she sees her case as being used to advance knowledge of her condition, she may decide her, her discomfort is justified. If she sees the end as careerist, she may not. I would advise those who write about illness and disability then to err on the side of restraint. It may not be enough to take the precaution of disguising a patient's identity or of obtaining consent. The patient who gives consent may have no idea what, what, what it would be like to come upon her story in alien discourse. It may be advisable to assume that one's patient will read the narrative of her case and recognize it as her own, and to write accordingly if one writes and not to write if one imagines it will cause undue discomfort. So one kind of moral hazard arises when the boundary of the clinic is breached by narratives of disability. And that would be true of narratives of illness as well. But another kind arises when these two categories are conflated within the clinic. In my early work on narratives of illness and disability, in my very early work, I coined an umbrella term, autopathography, to cover both, though I approached illnesses and disabilities separately. I was careful to separate them in recovering bodies, and I was actually very quite a little nervous about the time, at the time, about even combining them in the same volume. This term appealed to me as a one-word alternative to what seemed alternative clumsy, a one-word alternative to what seemed clumsy labels like, well, narratives of illness and disability. I guess uh, that's going to be a lot to repeat and repeat and repeat, or narratives of anomalous somatic conditions. I mean, illness and disability are both anomalous somatic conditions, but that's kind of a mouthful. So well, autopathography, that solves it all. But my neologism proved somewhat ill-advised. Various individ individuals with disabilities made it clear to me <laughs> that it was problematic to use the root patho to refer to their conditions, which were not illnesses and from which they did not necessarily suffer. So although my term has been picked up and perpetrated by others, perpetuated, by, perpetrated and perpetuated, <laughs> I have abandoned using it. Some years later, in writing an essay for an MLA volume, Teaching Life Writing, I coined a new term for such narratives, which I thought was rather clever, quality of life writing, that is, taking life writing and quality of life and hyphenating quality of life as an adjective, quality of life writing, which combines the current, current academic term life writing with a term common in medical discourse, quality of life. In that essay, I argued as follows for teaching such narratives outside the clinic to the general population. Increasingly, to make decisions that often literally involve life or death, citizens need to understand illness and disability in cultural and historical contexts. With the aging of the North American population, the invention and application of new medical technologies, and a looming crisis in healthcare, Disability literacy will become all the more desirable and indeed indispensable as an attribute of an informed public. Narratives of disease and disability demand attention today in part because they epitomize quality of life issues crucial to public policy. So that's the quote from that essay. Most of my work is concerned with how published disability narratives function outside the clinic, even against the clinic by destigmatizing disability. That's really, I guess, I've said in defense of autopathography, because th that I think I said in the book that I see autopathography as inherently or, yeah, inherently anti 
pathographic. Today, however, I want to focus on the value of such narratives inside the clinic, broadly defined. My attention was focused on this matter a few years ago when the university at which I taught for most of my career created a new medical school <clears throat> without consulting its faculty, of course. Uh, that event prompted me, as the founder and director of Hofstra's Disability Studies Program, to think about my work in a new context. And interestingly, the dean, though the faculty wasn't really consulted, I mean, in the decision, at some point the dean of liberal arts and studies uh, patched together a committee of faculty sort of to be advisory to the medical school. And did he think to include the founder and director of the Disability Studies Program? No, he did not. Why would he do that? You know. yeah. So, but um, being a little pushy, I, I was at that time tenured. I said, well, you know, I really should be on this committee. So I was added to the committee, and I got to make my pitch to the to the new director of the of the new medical school, who nodded politely. Um, how I wondered might the new medical curriculum integrate disability studies generally and quality of life writing in particular. Now, quality of life may seem a neutral and unobjectionable term, but it happens. If probably most of you know, to be quite fraught, because its clinical application too often encodes a medical bias against illness and disability. Wait, what? Why call this a bias? Shouldn't physicians be against illness? Isn't the point of medicine to heal the sick? Well, sure, this preference, to name it more neutrally, is inherent in medical practice, and rightly so. Much of the time, medicine's constructs work well enough. But medicine operates within, not outside, cultural contexts. And so medicine often encodes and thus reinforces common prejudices against certain kinds of bodies. Good evidence of this, if we needed it, appeared in a recent TED talk by Dr. Peter Attia, who, according to a New York Times story, quote, admitted to something he believes many doctors may, in fact, be guilty of that compassion for overweight and obese patients often is not quite as deep as it is for those who are sick for other reasons, the unlucky ones, for instance, who develop cancer or another disease through no apparent fault of their own. Many viewers were moved by uh, Dr. Appia's, Attia's apology to a diabetic patient that he admitted having blame for her condition. I would have been more impressed by his apology had it not been prompted by his own having been diagnosed with diabetes himself despite what he considers his very healthy lifestyle. Now, having questioned the medical preference for health, I want to distinguish disability from illness. Admittedly, in practice, the two often overlap. They often coexist in the same bodies. Indeed, illness and disability have reciprocal relations. Each can cause the other. Moreover, for legal purposes, many physical illnesses, like HIV, AIDS, cancer, and diabetes, and mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar syndrome, count as disabilities. Thus, while illness and disability are conceptually distinct, the ill and disabled are not distinct populations, and the line between disability and illness is not always clear. But while it is very difficult to draw a sharp line between them, or even to clearly articulate the difference, there is a distinction, and it matters. It matters in part because the conflation of disability with illness necessarily engages the medical <coughs> paradigm with its preference for health and wholeness. This paradigm hails or interpellates interpel interpel disabled people as sick and or defective. It constructs their conditions as requiring medical intervention, which is not always fruitful or even desirable, or even desire. This conflation tends to pathologize disability willy-nilly. It may project a desire for cure where it does not exist. A related danger of conflating disability with illness lies in undervaluing the lives of disabled people. Numerous studies have established that people with significant disabilities rate their quality of life nearly as high as non-disabled people rate theirs. Many disabled people are surprisingly well adjusted to their conditions, especially if their impairments are congenital or acquired early. In contrast, non-disabled people, especially medical professionals, typically consider the quality of life of disabled to be quite poor. Here we can begin to see the danger of the medical bias in favor of health. Disabled people do not share, 
cannot understand and are justifiably offended by the attitude of non-disabled people that their lives are of poor quality or even not worth living. So there's always a danger in writing about someone's disability that the writer will project onto a subject his or her own imagined response to being in that condition. Empathic intentions may be undermined by this projection. This is why the golden rule falls short. The way you think you would like others to treat you if you were disabled may not be the way disabled people want you to treat them, or the way you would want to be treated should you become disabled. That's a big problem, actually. And I've only recently kind of grappled with it in, in, the, in the way that I'm understanding it now. A significant obstacle to, to the delivery of healthcare to disabled people, then, is the disparity between the self-reports of their quality of life and the estimates of their quality of life by medical professionals. Non-disabled healthcare professionals render lower estimates of the quality of life of disabled people than those rendered by the general non-disabled population, and much lower estimates than the self-reports of people with disabilities. So you've got these three things. You've got the self-reports, and they, I emphasize reports, of people with disabilities. Again, generally about as high as the self-reports of non-disabled people's quality of life. Then you've got non-disabled people's estimates of the quality of life of people with disabilities, and those are always lower. And then you've got non-disabled medical professionals' <laughs> estimates of the quality of life of people with disabilities, and those are even lower than the general non-disabled population's estimates. I hope you've got those three things, okay? Um, now, a little parenthesis. The term non-disabled health care professionals is not tautological, but it's nearly redundant, because medical schools have not traditionally accepted disabled students. Um, I would refer to this discrepancy between the high first-person reports of the, their own quality of life by people with disabilities and the low third-person estimates of their quality of life as the gap. Okay, when I refer to the, the gap, I'm talking about the gap between the self-reports and the third person, the first-person reports and the third-person estimates. That's, I think, where a lot of work needs to be done and where life narrative can, can play a great role. As I've said, since medical professionals are, 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 after all, or above all, dedicated to the improvement of physical and mental well being, mental well being, they might be expected to devalue states of impairment and illness. So the gap may not be surprising, but it's disturbing. And more than that, it's dangerous. Critical disability studies makes a cru crucial distinction between impairment, which is found in the body, and disability, which is found in the environment's response to the impaired body. And I think you're probably all familiar with that distinction. So much of disability studies ge is generated by that distinction. I want to invoke that distinction to explore some implications of these discrepant perceptions of the quality of life of people with disabilities. First, I would argue that the gap itself exposes a hidden impairment a collective mind blindness in non-disabled people, especially healthcare professionals who are unable to imagine what disabled people are thinking and feeling. One could say that this supposedly non-disabled population actually has a significant cognitive deficit. And I think some of you know that I'm picking up this term mind blindness, mind blindness from some of the thinking about autism. Second, the gap constitutes a disability the underestimation of their quality of life by non-disabled people is a significant part of the prejudicial environment in which disabled people struggle to live with dignity. I mean prejudicial in the literal sense. Their lives are prejudged by others to be low in quality. And unlike some other aspects of the environment, like inaccessible facilities, the gap cannot be legislated away. Interestingly, um, the AMA, I think, recently decided that obesity should be called a disease, which is as close as you can come to legislating away, or trying to legislate away, you know, a, a stigma. Say, say it's a disease, just say it's a disease, and the New York Times recently said I've had a thing about should it or shouldn't it, and there, there are, you know, there are arguments on both sides, but that's not legislation, that's the, the ADA cannot legislate away uh, prejudice, it can legislate away barriers, or try to, and so on. 
the physical environment is, is res resistant in many ways, but the, the uh, psychological environment is, is resistant, resistant in different ways. The underestimation of the quality of life of disabled people, while not a narrative in the narrow sense of the term, is a, mis is a representation, actually a misrepresentation, that informs and generates powerful narratives. Indeed, this mind blindness can have life or death consequences in the delivery of health care to people with disabilities. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, you probably hear it yourselves. I have a colleague, William Peace, who blogs under the title Bad Cripple, and I would recommend his blog. Um, um, he is an anthropologist, a longtime paraplegic, who recently had to be hospitalized for a pressure wound, and he was informed soon after his admission by a very sympathetic physician that he could be made comfortable if he wished to decline aggressive treatment. He got on the phone <laughs> and made sure he had lots of visitors and that this doctor knew he was an anthropologist and an academic so that his life would be revalued. Um, and you hear 